and one. Perfect. All right, so roadmap, no pun intended. So Curtis gave us a nice intro, body versus bike. Uh, we're going to talk about what exactly is cycling efficiency. And we're going to break down one key component, or in other words, a low-hanging fruit that can improve cycling efficiency and kind of talking about bodies and balance and things like that um, in order to promote comfort in the saddle and efficiency and performance. So the two things that we care about probably the most. Then we're going to do a little bit of a demo. So someone gets to get treated a little bit, and then we're going to go into a case study. So we covered that. So what is cycling efficiency? So in the exercise physiology sense, uh, movement economy is doing the same amount of uh, work, covering the same amount of distance, taking the least amount of energy or oxygen. In the cycling stance, so it's power produced for the least amount of energy or oxygen consumed to produce the same amount of wattage. This has three components. So first is mobility. So as Curtis just talked about, this is a really important piece. It's the mobility of the relevant joints associated with cycling for the individual to accomplish um, the required range in order to uh, move through one pedal stroke. I've got the joints listed, most important as it relates to cycling. We're not getting into you know, the fingers or anything like that, so those are kind of the primary. So first is mobility, two is stability. So this is the stability of the spine, upper and lower extremities to maintain an efficient alignment through the pedal stroke. This is both active and passive. Mm -hmm. Passive is more so keeping your posture on the bike. Active is as you're using your lower extremity to move through that revolution without aberrant movement. So that's going to cause an energy leak and therefore influencing movement economy. And so I found a good study that looks at just this. The poor subjects in this study, they gave their core an offer it couldn't refuse. They worked them, they kind of worked their course to death and had and looked at uh, markers of cycling performance, um, power. Um, uh, peak torque and, um, and other. And so what they found actually whenever they severely fatigued the core, they actually found a decrease 30 to 43 percent. That's pretty significant. In peak torque, average power, max rep, total work, as well as total frontal and sagittal. So frontal plane just means this plane here, sagittal is this plane. It's a, we want this plane, however, too much is not good. And so that's that um, unwanted motion, that's that energy leak. And so if, if any of you want the protocol for this study, I'll send you an email, but I don't know if any of us want to do that. <laughs> third, so first mobility, second stability, third is strength and power. That's combining your mobility and your stability to sustain and um, have appropriate uh, for prolonged periods of time and force. So that's where functional threshold power comes into play. So those are the three primary needed for cycling efficiency. So the, the meat of this talk is going to talk about hip flexion. This is one, again, lowest hanging fruit that picks up all of those three components of cycling efficiency. It affects above and below. So I wanted to do something so we can all take away at least something from this presentation because most of us can, um, I would say in the clinic, about 90% of us and the cyclists we see coming in, this has a massive effect on their cycling performance. So what is hip flexion if we don't know already? That's pulling your knee to your chest. Is a combination of about four joints that do so, but for the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus on how your femur or thigh bone moves relative to your pelvis. Your pelvis is the bone that connects your lower extremity to your trunk. So recommended value, just so you have a number, some of us like data, especially out here in Silicon Valley. So 110 is the layman, so that's about this much here. However, with our cyclists, we want 120 to 150, um, especially the more aggressive position you have on the bike ergo arrow position on the bike. So and as an outsider, you want to be able to bring your thigh to your rib cage easily with a block, without a block from behind or a block from, behind, from the front. So from behind, that's your hamstring, that's your glutes. From the front, that's the ability for that tissue to actually fold. So our soft tissue should be able to lengthen and also fold. And so it's really important to soften up the tissue in the front as well on top of the joint mechanics so that you can bring your knee to your chest much easier. So how does this manifest with dysfunction? So Curtis mentioned a second ago, uh, dragging brakes. So you might be your own drag dragging brakes. So you're fighting these mechanical barriers in order to come over the top of the pedal stroke. This lack of mobility, there go, becomes lack loss of efficiency. And other joints have to accommodate for or move instead of this stiff link. So the, you know, the children's rhyme, the knee bone connects to the hip bone kind of thing. That's actually quite true. When one is stiff, you've got to send that effort up or effort up or down. All right. So next, 
Um, these are the three most common problems that we see in the clinic, um, especially as it relates to hip flexion, but we can, we've seen hip flexion ripple all the way up to the neck. So first is low back pain. So our hip is going to be pushing us around a little bit. So what this results in, if you don't have appropriate range coming over the top of the pedal stroke, you're going to round your back in order to bring your leg through there. That's uncomfortable on your back. If your low back is rounded, your mid-back or thoracic spine is also going to round, but you're not going to be looking straight down at the ground. You have to keep your eyes forward, and so therefore that's compensation up into the neck, which could lead to other dysfunction and discomfort. Finally, or secondly, um, as mentioned before, this uh, inappropriate motion is sent to joints up or below, namely a side joint and spine. That's a common spot, and we're going to talk about this a lot. That leads to efficiency and economy loss. We're using musculature to stabilize this extraneous movement, the movement that we don't want, leading to unnecessary fatigue. Second is saddle pain. So included within this is hip and pelvis. So have any of you seen anyone riding down the road and their knees are like this? Tell them, hey, you need hip flexion. <laughs> Might not get a good response back, but external rotation of the hip. Our body, our brain is gonna tell our body to do something. However, we may not have that range, and so we cheat. And this is the path easiest taken if we don't have this motion. And so that external rotation of the hip, therefore, leads to knee collapsing in as we come down at the end of the stroke. And that can contribute to knee dysfunction, which we'll talk about in a second. Additionally, so just a, a, a tight hip in general, the musculature around the hip, the joints, uh, or the soft tissue around the hip, that's compression in the, in the joint. Some of us might have impingement in our hip. It's quite common among cyclists, especially if we don't address our hip mobility. So FAI stands for femoral acetabular impingement. You don't have to memorize that. However, what that means is, so when we have compression in the joint, those bone surfaces actually hit, and the bone starts to grow a little bit. And so that's when we get pinching in the joint, and we can result in a labral tear. With his consent, that's actually uh, Curtis has had that. However, he's a great example of how physical therapy and bike fit accommodation can help. <laughs> Secondly is pelvis. So rocking in the saddle again, lack of hip mobility is going to move your pelvis around. A little bit of pelvic mobility up and down and forward and back is okay, but too much can cause friction, pressure sore, saddle sores, things like that. Other implications, if your pelvis is moving a lot, what do your hands have to do to stabilize? And so there are other things, again, sent upstream just by this what seems simple hip mobility loss. Okay, finally knee pain. So that's that wobbly knee. Whenever our hip escapes and goes out to the side, we have to go across. That's causing a bit of rotation in the joint. So our hip or our knee joint is a lot like a door hinge. And so it's named a hinge joint. It does allow a little bit of rotation. However, the rotation under load and, um, and repetition, that can contribute to pain. So if your door, if your knee is the door, that door is not going to close very well, and it's also not going to be very comfortable. And then, so how does this influence efficiency and performance? So there are a lot of good studies looking at just purely being in a good alignment through your spine allows for an automatic core engagement, and actually about a 25 to 50% increase in force put out through the extremities. So your back not being in this rounded position and being in a more neutral position allows for better core recruitment and therefore power output. This improved economy um, works without tiring those core stabilizers. So if you think about that study mentioned earlier, you're able to perform a similar amount of work without just absolutely blowing out your core. And we saw the effect of an extremely fatigued core or undertrained core and the influence on what our legs are doing and how, what our power and performance looks like on the bike. Pelvic girdle, this follows how the spine is. So when we're in a neutral pelvis, stable core, more power. So that one's a, little, a bit simpler. And um, a stable pelvis and preventing that rocking, that's that energy link, again, corresponding to economy and sustainability on the bike. Finally, with the hip, the sooner you can clear the top of the pedal stroke, the sooner you can push down, which increases arc of power or arc of force and therefore power. Knee, absence of the knee wobble, you can push on the pedal sooner, and this has been found to have increases in power. All right, bringing it full circle. So having appropriate mobility creates a great environment for stability, 
However, just being in a good alignment isn't enough. We need to train ourselves in this good alignment, setting us up for um, an optimal um, ecosystem of our body for power and strength. So demo. So only if you're comfortable. So we'll bring one of you up. One you can raise if you, if you just have a really tight hip and you want it mobilized. I'll just show you just one thing we do in the clinic, give you an exercise, and I'll give you all a couple exercise options to take away from this. Um, so any volunteers, otherwise we can test some things out. <laughs> Great, fabulous. <laughs> all right, what's your name? Angie. Angie, Great. nice to meet you. I don't know if it's super tight, but okay. since nobody volunteered, I'm like, all right, yeah, sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> all right, what's your um, Probably my right one is always my stronger hip. Okay, yeah, let me have you do a test slow. really quick. Go ahead and march that right leg up. And then left. Okay. I just ran at 50K, so they're oh, little, they're a little, little, little step. Right a <laughs> okay, so it might look like at your, your left hip actually is okay. a little bit stiffer. So we'll bring you to the table. So let's go ahead. We'll go over here. And then we'll see what you look like. Go ahead and land back. And we'll see another assessment, just how easily you can come to your chest. And let me know if you have any discomfort or anything. So about here, I start to get a bit of a block. And so you can see this is quite quite some range from her trunk. Let's see your other side. Where is your 50K? Uh, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So this side, I don't get that firm and feel so about here. Not perfect, but not as good or not as bad, I would say, as it looks like. All right, so let's see. So this is just a simple joint mobilization. These are things that you can do, and I'll show you how to do this on your own at home. And so we'll bring you up to that barrier. Again, let me know if there's any discomfort. Only pressure is what you should feel here. So we'll bring you up here. This downward force is just how the joint should move in space to allow for flexion. All right, go ahead and push toward me. And relax. Okay. And push short in. And relax. Good. Do you notice any discomfort in your back, hip, or knee on the bike? Good. My saddle. I, I always have discomfort on the side. Okay. When you talked about that, I was like, ooh, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. And relax, great. So whenever we gain range into a joint, there's a whole lot of real estate our brain's unaware of. So that muscular contraction following is important. So what we're gonna do, so I'm gonna keep you right here. Go ahead and hold. Be on the out of your hands. Okay. And perfect. Hold here. And keep holding. Good. And slowly relax. So as a home exercise program, what she could do, take your left hand, place that right here. Good. And you're going to hold right here, slowly traction up. This is also a great exercise to recruit your core before a ride. You can pair it with a push down with this leg. This is deconstructed gait. It's also deconstructed pulling your leg through the top of the pedal stroke and pushing down. So it's kind of, it catches a lot of things from out of the sport. And go and relax. Good. All right. So let's just test. That is really quick. Just how easily we can move from the top. So that's about 30 seconds of work. So it's pretty, it's pretty great. So let me give you so we use a bike tube for this, it's very on brand. <laughs> and we, we we buy tubes in bulk, so we <laughs> <laughs> a box full. Yeah. Um, Trader tubes. Trader tubes. Yeah. <laughs> Must give me a tip of the year. So what you can do here, and these are all things we'll provide our emails at the end. We can send you videos for and everything like that, so that she's not only getting the benefit here. All right. So you're gonna pull this to your chest. 
place that you tighten your hip crease. Go ahead and hold your leg with your hands. You're going to put your other foot right here. So you're doing what I just did. That is. Go ahead and kick all the way down. Good. Little secondary quad strengthening. Go ahead, go ahead and bring your arm right there. And then what you can do, you can do muscular contractions so you can press out. So go ahead and press out with your hands. Good. And relax. Of equal magnitude, a muscle contracts. It should also relax. So that's a good way to re reduce some soft tissue restriction. And you can do different angles. You press this way, this way, this way. You can kind of bottom your knee around. How long do you hold the contraction? About three to five seconds. Okay. Or so. Yeah. No perfect science on that, but at least three seconds. Yeah. And go ahead and relax. Fabulous. And we'll take this down. And you can keep this. Thank you so much for coming up. Great. So next, so yeah, the take home. So the exercises that you're going to be getting um, from PT, there's no cookie cutter here. So it's very dependent on your history, your goals, and the presentation. In general, though, we want mobility for the front, mobility for the back, and then a neuromuscular exercise to reinforce that range. That's that real estate idea. So that's what we did when I was holding her leg still and what she would do, just holding herself in that position after she mobilizes her hip very effective before a ride. All right, so I'm just going to show general photos of exercise options that I give in the clinic for those three. So mobility anterior, which means in the front. That's what she just did right there. We've got foam rolling. Foam rolling is great. It's a very PT 101 exercise, but very effective, especially through the quads, IT band, hamstring. We've got another option of a hip capsule mobilization. You can do this kneeling with a band out to the side, from the back, from the front. This is a good hip flexor quad um, stretch. You can alter the angle of your knee. So it's not just straight down so that you can pick up more musculature, dec decreasing compression of the joint. And then the photos, or this is blocking that, but that's cupping on your quad. So cu cupping is very effective for reducing soft tissue restriction. Mobility posterior or behind, so we've got foam rolling through glutes, hamstrings, cupping through the uh, associated musculature. Elevated pigeon stretch, so almost like a pigeon on the ground, but you're elevated. That, oh, that stretches your, your posterior, posterior means behind, hip capsule, allowing your femur to sit better in the socket. That allows for better hip flexion. This is a good dynamic exercise for hamstring length. This is great for your key wall and back stretching. And lacrosse ball, you can't un a, another PT 101, but still effective lacrosse ball through the glutes and hamstrings. And then re-education, this is an exercise reinforcing glute contraction. If we have appropriate glute contraction, that actually pulls our femur back and to the appropriate spot, allowing for better hip mobility. This is what I, I, I gave earlier. So that's pressing and reinforcing that hip flexion. And this exercise is called bobbing bird. It's very cycling specific and allows you to recruit your glute in increased ranges of flexion. A lot of us don't use our glutes efficiently on the bike. All right, so now going into a case study. So with his consent, we've been working with Chris Carmichael the past couple of months. He came in, he had a left hip replacement last January, about a year ago, he had a right knee replacement. And he has a true leg length difference on his right side following you know, history of trauma. He's a cyclist. Um, and uh, so a true leg length means that the femur or tibia is actually shorter. Functional just has to do with how our body is standing in space. Kind of what Curtis explained earlier, if you have a collapsed foot, that's, that could present as a functional leg length difference. That's just an aside. Treatment, hip mobility, knee mobility, strength to reinforce, a lot of functional strengthening associated with cycling and improving that hip and uh, uh, knee range of motion and result or uh, actually at the beginning so he came in with oops that's okay so he had an average about three out of ten discomfort at rest six out of ten on the bike he had a 10 to 12 watt difference in his power meter and he just said he felt really unbalanced on the bike and he had quite a bit of knee pain and swelling following his rides so after just a about a couple weeks of treatment or so, zero to 10 at rest, one out of 10 max at bike, and he's able to complete his desired volume on the bike now. And only a, a d discrepancy of three to four watts side to side, which is A-OK -okay for him. All right, moving on to Justin. Oh, now we're yeah. gonna talk about okay. the uh, bike fit side cool. of things. Yes, absolutely. All right, so the thing with Chris was he had, yeah, he had some, some really funny stories about, he, he, made, he mentioned meeting Eddie Merckx's mechanic at the track in, in Belgium in the 70s. 
and having him look at his bike while smoking. You have to be smoking. And gets out a two by four, loosens up the saddle, eh, slams the saddle back. Okay, that's good. And then for the stem, loosens up the stem, slams the stem down. That was the bike fit in 1970s. So. <laughs> that was, uh, and that's where he came from with that. I think I, he broke his femur in that era. Yeah, it was he had, a, he had a very significant femur fracture that never healed right. And then spent the next 30 years with a significant bony leg length difference. And the, ultimately, the result was most likely the hip replacement and the knee replacement because he was so out of balance. I mean, it was just staggering. Uh, it was so fundamentally off in the bike. We'll get into some more details on on on, on some of some of the asymmetries that showed up when we first had him come in. But I wanted to step back a second because Juliet's talking a lot about hip flexion range of motion. We're also going to get into a little bit about knee pain related to this. But the the lever, the literal lever to pull when it comes to dealing with this is crank arm length. Uh, is almost like you said, like 90% of the people that come in have significant restrictions in hip flexion range of motion. Uh, you're going to find that particularly as you start getting into bike racing, when you're leaning forwards more and you're trying to get more aero, it means you're closing off your hips more and you're demanding more of that range of motion. You're getting more towards that 120 to 150 range, which is like nobody has. So like we obviously want to come at this from a body side. We want to be able to mobilize this joint that's very mobilizable. Uh, 30 seconds can dramatically improve <laughs> Uh, uh, how the, how things work, but there's no sense in unnecessarily stressing the joint with limited range of motion via too long of a crank arm when crank arms are not a functional source of leverage on the bicycle. Um, leverage is obviously important, but the crank arm is not the source of leverage. Uh, that's why I have a picture of gears there. The important thing to think about with crank arms is that they are not independently a source of leverage. They are a user interface for the drivetrain. They're what allows you to access the leverage provided by the gears. And why wouldn't we want to optimize that source of interface uh, so that it works better for our bodies? And then it's particularly now, we, we go back, you know, even 10 years, but we go back 15, 20 years, 30 years ago, I started out, my first bike had a 4221 uh, was a low gear. <clears throat> and that's hard to go up hills on. Uh, to say the least. Uh, but now it's like there's no excuse for it. My current bike has a 10 tooth differential low gear. I've got a 4252 uh, on a one by, and I love it. It's nothing better for going up Redwood Gulch if you've all been down uh, in that area. Like, wow. Gearing is not an issue anymore. We can optimize around gearing. Uh, so we don't have to worry about leverage. Uh, just, just put that out there. I think I'm going to, it comes up in a second here. There was a uh, Martin et al. Um, is that this one? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, you know, the, 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 the sense is that the bigger the lever, the better. And it's, it's edge cases, that's true. Uh, if you're on a single speed, uh, a longer crank car makes your gear bigger. But why not just optimize the gear? Like, it's like it doesn't make any sense. It, 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 it's, it's, you're giving up something somewhere. Um, and the, the Martin et al. study is sort of legendary in cycling circles because... What they did is they took cranks from 120 to 220 millimeters, and they did a series of tests. And what they ultimately found is in the sweet spot range, which was about 140 to 190, there was no decrease. There was no functional difference in power output. And the only change happened at the extremes at a 120 and a 220, and power went down, even at 220. And there's a whole thing out there on the really long cranks. And the, 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 the takeaway is that there's no free lunch. Uh, it's, the power is, is, is ultimately largely uh, metabolic. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, the limiter isn't absolute leverage. Uh, the, the limiter is our ability to deliver oxygen to working muscles and to be comfortable over long periods of time. For our crank arms. This uh, article on Appleman Cycles website is fantastic. They recently updated it. It's just got it's got all the info on crank arm length. If you want the the, the comprehensive go into on it, and obviously they have a bias on this, uh, they make crank arms and they make short crank arms. <laughs> uh, but but I think it, he got into this largely driven by the sense that there were no good solutions for. Um, and so he, he recognized the problem and then he started making shorter crank arms and they'll do even some of, we had, we had a, a woman 
who had a, a, a very serious ankle fracture 30 years ago, um, resulted in this massive leg length difference, like 35 millimeters or something like that. I mean, it's literally crippling. I mean, it's a, this is it was a you know, disability level challenge. Um, got her on 135 and 165 cranks, just life changing experience. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that Appleman does. You know, they're, they're, they're just wonderful, wonderful <laughs> resources for, for cyclists. Um, anyway, so crank arms, user interface to the drivetrain, not a source of leverage, can be optimized to help improve your interface with the bike. And it should be GIFing. Yeah, it is. Um, and so the, the key thing is that there's, there's two things that happen with, with shorter crank arms. Um, the, 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 at the bottom of the pedal stroke, the, re, the reach to the pedals has been reduced. So in order to maintain your knee angle at, at, at your peak extension, you need to raise the saddle uh, an equivalent amount, roughly, uh, to how much you just changed the length of the crank arm. But then at the top of the pedal stroke, the crank's reducing in length too, and so that makes the, the space that you have to navigate at the top less by an equivalent amount. But then, so what it effectively does is you raise the seat by, you know, if you go from 172.5 to 165, seven and a quarter millimeters, and then you decrease that crank arm distance by seven and a quarter millimeters, you have a net 15 mil change in, 14 and a half mil, uh, change in, the, the, the space at the top of the pole stroke, which translates into a, a significant increase in hip flexion range of motion, uh, or I should say space for hip flexion. So you don't have to get to those extremes. So you, if you are going into a more extreme position, you have more room for your hips to maneuver successfully. Um, and then there's all these things that come along with, with shorter crank arms that are nice. I mean, particularly toe overlap. Um, short crank arms, in particular for smaller riders, are just life altering. Uh, it completely changes the whole interface of the bicycle. Um, but then, you know, Appleman talks about it on his website. He's like 6'2". He's riding 145 cranks. He couldn't be happier. Um, you know, you see it in triathlon in particular because they're all super slammed forward. And they're not doing peak power output. They're trying to be as efficient as possible. And this comes back to something that Juliet mentioned. As soon as you start challenging that range of motion at the top of the pedal stroke, you're involving musculature doing things. You're pulling, pushing, twisting, resisting, fighting, and that's energy that is not going into driving the pedals. Um, and in a triathlon context, you see guys that are my height running 155s because you can keep your hips open. You can keep pedaling smoothly and fluidly. You can go as far as you want. Uh, what else do I have on the list here? I mean, saddle stability is another one. And, you know, you're again, you're taking away that, that input at the top of the pedal stroke. Less things to fight against, easier to stay stable and comfortable in the saddle. Yeah, it, it's easier to take a deep breath too. I mean, that's like ultimately getting down into it. You're you're pushing less on on your torso. You can you can you can lengthen your torso more effectively. You can take a deeper breath. Use your diaphragm more effectively. All good things. Um, and then here's the other one that's really interesting is. <clears throat> Getting into that, that minimum knee angle or the maximum knee flexion angle uh, at the top of the pedal stroke because they, they go in tandem because the more, you, more you're, you're in that compromised position, the more your knee has to bend, the more your hip has to bend, the more pressure there is in your kneecap. And you're doing that 80, 90, 100 times a, a minute and you're putting force through that. And what the shorter cranks do is they allow you to keep that knee angle open at the top of the pedal stroke more effectively take pressure off of the kneecap, reduce pressure across the whole system. Fantastic. And it tends to reduce a, a lot of those side effects that Juliet was talking about, that tendency to externally rotate at the top. It lets your knees track better. Uh, the hinge joint's going to work better. Exactly. All right. Here's Chris. Um, and so the, the, the knee replacement resulted in, I think it was 98 degrees, was basically maximum knee flexion angle, which is not very much. Um, and I, mean, yeah, I, think, I don't think he could get his knee bent much more than it is in that picture. And that, that's actually pushing him past that peak bending point. And that, well, that ended up being one of the most significant limiters because he, he just couldn't get through the top of the pedal stroke. And he was getting pushed around on the bike, getting forced into his, his saddle, um, and then there were other, the other factor here was, 
15 degree maximum knee extension angle. That's completely impossible. I mean, it's like his leg was completely locked out. And he had actually just raised his saddle to try to make more room for his knee, which totally makes sense. That's actually exactly kind of what, where you would go to try to, to get through the top of the pedal stroke like that. But, but because his right leg was so much shorter than his left leg, it resulted in this, this, this completely unsustainable level of knee extension. And he was just all over the place and just getting yanked around. And it's, it's the, the, the paradox, the catch-22 of when cranks, uh, when shorter cranks end up becoming really, really, really effective is when the saddle is both too high and too low. This is way too high, but it's also not high enough for his knee. And so it's, it creates this impossible scenario. Um, and so we absolutely get in there and mobilize, um, even during this session in acute dose of physical therapy and just in a few minutes, got his knee flexion, uh, number to some more like 108, which is in the ballpark for tolerable for on the bike, but it's still really borderline. Um, and we were able to make some changes to his position, shift things around, and we were able to get him to a point where this is actually with about 105, 108 degrees of knee flexion range of motion. But it's one of the things that Curtis and Julia talked about is that sort of neural retraining that happens. And he was so used to having to protect that knee because motion was so limited that he was having trouble actually going through that range of motion, even though it was technically there. And so part of what we started looking into was getting into some exercises to get him used to using the knee in that capacity more frequently and more regularly. But then also this is where we start getting into short crank arms. Because if we if we drop, because he was on 172.5s? I think he was on 172.5s. Yeah. Um, and we take that, that net 15 mil change translates into at least 10 degrees extra range of motion somewhere in that neighborhood. And then we're good. Um, we're, 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 fun, we're moving. Um, we're in we're in a place where where we can accommodate that knee as it is, fully expecting that to get better because this was significantly trauma influenced, but it's going to improve. And then, even then, this is this is before we were able to get him on short cranks. We dropped the saddle. We made some changes. We've got him do a 21 degree knee angle. It's still not even close to enough. It's way too straight. Um, extremely unstable on the saddle. But there, at this point, there wasn't any room to continue doing that. And the only solution is to plug in that short crank arm and allow us to, to, to manipulate the system to accommodate the rider. And the good thing is with the crank arms that there's just no downside. So getting back to it, you can really start to see how that changes. It's the same gift from before, but... Um, <clears throat> It, it's if we can if we can go from a 60 degree knee angle to a 74 degree knee angle just by changing the crank arm length that's fantastic that's absolutely that's that's totally a game changer for somebody that has dysfunctional knees and tight hips and it doesn't even have to be that magnitude of difference like i said seven and a quarter mil can be very significant if you're thinking of dropping two like going from 172.5 to 170s this is not worth it uh, it, yeah, it's going to have some impact, but go yard. Uh, 165 from a 175 is going to be a significant difference. It's going to make a difference. Um, and then combining that from the other end, obviously attacking the body, getting into the hips, getting you as mobile as you can so that you're fluid and smooth and you're not wasting energy. The brakes are not on. You're not dragging. You're not wasting effort. Um, this was Chris's saddle pressure before. He was basically just pinned on the left side of his saddle uh, by his extreme dysfunction on the, on the right side. And we were able to get him to a point where he was, he was able to effectively load the saddle, even without short crank arms. And we get into a short crank arm scenario, and you start to see this, the stability component, shrink. So that he's moving less side to side. The pelvis is more stable on the saddle. Again, more efficient, less energy loss. The kind of things we're looking for. I um, also wanted to have a mention in here about these bars. Uh, bars in general are something that doesn't get thought about a lot. Um, when Chris came in, one of the things that he was really struggling with, and it was really hard for him to get comfortable on the bike, was he was essentially pivoting up onto the bars to, to try to take pressure off of the whole back end of the system. Um, really high pressure on his hands. 
And something like switching to a bar like the uh, the coefficient wave bar, the, the, there's there's all kinds of advantages to, to to being able to get your hands into a better position combined with all this other stuff. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that really comes up, and it's kind of au courant to talk about narrow bars, but almost everybody is on bars that are too wide. Um, it's extremely common. And you'll find significant strength inferences. If somebody comes in, their shoulders measure 38, you can even see a difference between a 40 centimeter grip width and a 38 centimeter grip width in a way that translates into improved outcomes of the bike. So you're more stable, you're more comfortable, your joints are more aligned, you can get the wrists into a more neutral position. And something like these bars, the whole intent behind that is, yeah, it's narrow or it's more arrow, but it also lets you get to that place where you can find a neutral position for your hands and wrists. All right, references. I think we're good. In case anybody's curious, read the Appleman Go check out his website. It's fantastic stuff. And it's also really cool looking. Are we done? Oh, yeah. And then, of course, um, you know, for anyone that 20% off, if, if, if anybody wants to come in and talk to us about PT or bike fit, uh, offer for, for uh, uh, Penn Bellow members here today. All right. Thank you. Anyone here, not just Penn Bellow.